Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Great to see you all coming in. So nice to see everybody. Welcome to the Experimental Weaving talk series. We are so excited about this morning's speaker, so I will keep things brief. I want to just um, introduce this talk series, which, of course, um, Laura and I host out of the Unstable Design Lab at the Roser Atlas Institute at CU Boulder in Boulder, Colorado. Um, this talk series is an opportunity for us to invite some of our favorite and most fascinating weavers that we've been working with throughout this residency process and throughout the residency application process um, and other different venues um, and inviting them here to talk about their practice and their how they see the how they see this question of experimental weaving in their practice and so this series includes designers, artists, people working in and out of industry, people in and out of academia, people working in fine arts, all sorts of different fields. It's a very interdisciplinary series. Um, and our penultimate uh, speaker uh, this morning is uh, Victoria. And we are so excited. Don't forget, we have one more speaker uh, coming on the 30th of November. All right, I'll introduce the amazing and unanimous. Oh, I don't know if that word I'm using it right. I'll just stop. Um, two cups of coffee. Um, introduce my incredible colleague and one of my favorite people, Laura Devendorf. Thanks. I'm I'm taken aback by the nice compliment. <laughs> oh my God, it's definitely one of my favorite people. <laughs> well, thanks. It's mutual. I'm glad we can share this moment. In <laughs> <laughs> um, so anyway, thank you all so much for joining us this morning. I'm really thrilled to welcome Victoria uh, with us today. And I've been doing this thing where I try not to do like canned, um, stuffy introductions where I read off your incredible list of accomplishments and awards because we all know about those but maybe speak a little bit more to why we were so interested in your practice and what we see you bringing to this community. So I think if you can define Victoria in one word it's energy <laughs> in all senses. So Victoria has an amazing energy that I think infuses her personality the few times we've met but also infuses her work in that it's never solely focused on one domain. It kind of beautifully hops between lots of different conceptual links and weaving and dyeing and collaborating with different people in different disciplines and now film production and engaging the community. And she's just been one of the most um, active and warm members of our experimental weaving community. And I'm so excited to be able to host you today and always to hear from you directly about your work. So without further ado, I will turn it over to you. And we can clap if it's helpful to have some. Yeah. <laughs> so rare right. to hear a real clap in a Zoom I know. like that. Usually just the emojis. I can so. turn the computer around because you're in my class <laughs> right now. Oh, wow. Um, all right, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Um, and I hope y'all can see it there. Um, no, wait, I've lost you. Um, and then before I begin, thank you, Laura. Thank you, Stephen. I'm so thrilled to be here, and that introduction really warms my heart. Um, it's a, a thrill to be a part of this community and to be an experimental weaver. And um, one of the things that I love so much about what y'all are doing is welcoming more and more people. I think that's a, a main mission of my life's work is to make more weavers. So um, thank you for, for doing that and creating this space for all of us. Um, so I'm excited to share my work with you all tonight and um, certainly open to answering any and all questions. It's become more and more important to me over time to be really transparent about my practice. Um, if anyone has any technical questions or just any questions about what it's like to be a practicing artist slash educator slash designer slash organizer, whatever um, the many hats that we all wear, I am very open to answering any question you might have. So um, I'm going to start by sharing some of my past work and some ongoing projects, and then I want to dig in a little bit to this idea of experimentation and what really makes weaving experimental. So um, I like to work with these really slow, really analog techniques, um, yarn spinner. Um, here's a spindle, but I also work with a wheel. Um, and I'm using mostly natural fibers with the yarn that I'm spinning like wool, silk, and cotton. 
Um, I also work with dyes, um, a mix of natural and synthetic dyes, um, many of which I am creating myself in the studio and many of which I'm getting prefabricated or you know, purchasing from the internet. Um, so conceptually, I think it's really interesting to combine materials that come from these two extremes, the, the natural thing that you find in um, you know, on the street or in the park, um, as opposed to that chemical with a skew number that's repeatable indefinitely um, from the internet. Um, because, of course, we don't get these synthetic things from the moon. They're also coming from the earth. We've just kind of forced them to behave in this new way. Um, so I, I like combining these materials as a way for us to examine those, those concepts of natural and synthetic. Um, I'm really big into swatch making and especially with the dye practice I'm just such a sucker for trying all the different mordants and modifiers and making these swatch cards as a way to document my process and uh, to inform my future self for, for new projects. And of course, I'm a weaver, an experimental one, sanctioned by our community here. Um, and I'm working primarily with jack floor looms. I have an eight harness shacked loom and a sayori that I love. Um, but I've also been recently getting more into the TC2. And um, I'm currently actually a resident in St. Gallen, Switzerland with Tada, um, where I've been working with industrial jacquards. Um, I'm also recently into machine knitting, which has been super fun, um, and both of these images are actually representative of projects that I've done on the knitting machine in collaboration with other artists. Um, the knitting machine really has been a location for me to collaborate. Um, and then I think this might be my last material slide, but I'm um, relatively recently as well in the last five, six years, uh, I've been focusing more on e-textiles and the kinds of materials that can pass electricity through them um, and the flexible components, things like speakers and heaters and um, other ways for us to make our technology soft. Okay, so let's look at a few images of some past projects. Um, so this is an example, I'll show a few more in a moment, of my large scale installation. So um, everything that we're gonna see now is sort of made with some combination of those materials and tools we've just looked at. Um, in these, situ in these, the case of these installations, I'm weaving all of the panels, I'm spinning some of the yarn, um, and I'm dyeing all of the, the colors that you see. The panels that hang from the ceiling are intersected by the panel that uh, begins on the floor. And you can see from this side view that those threads are coming in um, and, and connecting them all. Um, you might also notice the geography reference here. And so one of the things that I'm exploring conceptually in this project and a few of the others is uh, the way we map things. And the, the weaving space is, of course, very much a grid, but it's one that's a bit more dimensional than the, the thing we might see on a screen or on a piece of paper even. Um, so by creating these series of maps that hang in a series and then bringing the threads through at this other axis, I'm kind of exploring the dimension of the space and creating locations between locations. Here's a, a few more details so you can see that work a bit closer. Uh, another example of a project um, in the same vein where I'm weaving these panels and, and connecting them. Um, in the earlier iterations of these sorts of projects, I was creating the, this fourth panel and then with a tapestry needle bringing the um, extra warp thread through panel by panel. Um, but as I continued to experiment with this way of making, um, I started using techniques in double weave and being able to bring threads from a certain surface level into the interior, although that wasn't what I was doing on this one, so getting ahead of myself. Um, another example of, of an installation where here I'm growing them. We've got more panels. Um, and then this one is an example of where I started using double weave as a way to bring um, my warp thread through and making choices in actually not weaving sometimes. Um, an installation photo, the, the wood dust mask gives you a clue of when in the pandemic that happened. Um, back before we had access to masks, I was installing this piece um, in a collector's home. That was this piece. Um, and it was really cool for me to sell such a large installation piece. I think these sorts of things, I'm not making them to sell. Um, I'm making them in part because 
I am compelled to make in general, and I find that the process of weaving is a place for me to meditate on these themes about you know maps and locations and um, connecting places on maps. But when someone is interested in purchasing the piece and installing it in their home, it's both empowering and exciting for me that my work is being appreciated, but it's also financial support. And um, like I mentioned at the top, I'm really interested in being honest and frank about what it means to be an artist. And I think the financial side of it, being a practicing artist, is often um, under discussed and therefore artists continue to be underpaid and underappreciated as workers, as art workers. Um, here's an example of the largest installation in this sort of way that I've ever made and it's hanging in an old paper mill in um, Michigan where I was an artist in resident I guess it's uh, two years ago now at this point a year and a half ago um, so because the space itself is so big it's a bit hard to see the dimension I think um, but the pan the tallest panel is about 25 feet um, so if I were standing next to it I would my head would be you know not even halfway up um, and again, these are the panels that are hanging um, that have threads that are intersecting them. And you can sort of get a sense of the map that's happening. Um, I'm also making pieces that go on the wall that I call woven paintings. Um, and here I'm, I'm really mostly using the blended natural and synthetic dyes to make these um, abstract images. I often start with a map or with a, some sort of geography reference, but then let the process of dyeing or of weaving obscure um, those images. So a lot of these striations that you can see, they come from um, winding a warp and then uh, adding a weight to the back of my loom so that some of it is pulls through and then pulling that through the front. Um, I guess this maybe only makes sense to the weavers in the room, but playing with that tension and um, using the dimensionality and the um, sort of machine quality of my loom to create these images and abstractions. Here's some more images of works like that. Um, and whenever I have the chance to exhibit the work, I always look for opportunities to push the boundaries of the, the pieces and try something new. It's really fun to think of these works as sort of semi-site specific. So here's a photo from an exhibition I had at AIR Gallery in Brooklyn a couple years ago, um, where they really encouraged us to experiment with our presentation. So we decided to put some of the pieces onto the floor or onto the wall, or onto the ceiling, ceiling rather, wall is normal. Uh, close up of another one of these pieces. Um, in some of the cases, I'm making these custom platforms that I use a jigsaw to cut out, which matches the natural selvage of the textile. Um, and then in other cases, I've been taking the pieces actually off of the wall with these um, custom frames. Artist frames, I suppose we could call them. Here's another photo of a piece like that. Um, here is a public art commission that I had from Time Equities uh, that was in a lobby um, in downtown Manhattan, um, and that was, I think, the first time, oh, maybe first or second time I had the chance to show my work in a really non-art but public space, um, which I appreciated, and I've spent more time as, as the years have gone on thinking about where I want my, my work to be. Um, and more more of these pieces. So um, you you might imagine, weaver or not, that they're quite slow to make. Um, and I'm lucky to really enjoy the process um, because it can often be very meditative and repetitive. I also get to log a lot of TV podcast um, hours, um, you know, listening to something while my hands are busy. And it's always funny for me to somehow look back at these pieces and say, oh yeah, that was when I, you know, Got, listen to that audiobook or something. So in a way, they become these um, diary entries as well, these markers of time. Some more, more large pieces. I tried not to include too many, but um, yes, these are sort of a selection. And of course, I have more images of more works on my website and my Instagram, if you're curious, and some small ones as well. 
Um, and some I mentioned at the at the beginning that I've been experimenting with machine knitting, but here are uh, more specific examples where I've been working with a friend, uh, an artist named Amanda Martinez, and I've been knitting with our with the knitting machine her drawings. Okay, so transitioning into the more collaborative and um, ephemeral projects. Um, E-Textile Spring Break, which we iterated this year, and um, I know that some folks in your lab are a part of. I, I don't know if Sasha's on the call, but um, anyway, Sasha is one of the, the people that I'm collaborating with on this project, and it's really dear to my heart. It's a residency that welcomes practitioners who are exploring the intersections between electronics and textiles. And we gathered a group of 20 of us this year in Michigan and previous iterations have taken place in New York, um, France, Taiwan, and, and other places um, with different groups of organizers and different hosts. So if this sort of thing piques your interest, stay tuned and apply and join us next year for that residency. Um, it was uh, an initiative, at least the American iteration of it, that I was I became a part of after the first few years. So I'm one of the organizers, but not one of the founding organizers. Um, and it's been really cool for me to sort of be a steward of this project and join a team that already existed and add my um, my mark to it. Um, also, as someone who has done a lot of residencies and continues to get so much from them, it's also been really great to be on the other side of it and, and create an artist run residency. Um, Ancient Futures is a project that I'm working on in collaboration with Nicole Y. Messier, um, and we are weaving these installations that um, so far are hanging from the ceiling and the wall, but who knows where they might end up, and um, integrated are these fiber optics. Um, the fiber optics are connected to NeoPixels, which are connected to a software that uses sentiment analysis. Um, to translate any anything that a viewer might say into our microphone into either um, a sort of a positive, a neutral, or a negative um, reaction, and then we translate those into color. So the piece itself not only reacts to the thing that a viewer might say to it, but it also becomes a place to store all of the things that have been said to it. And the project is inspired by the history of textiles being a place to store information. There's so many curious examples, um, and I'd like to think that a big part of my practice, even though I'm very much a maker, is also in being a researcher. And so as we work with these materials and, and we think about ways we can tell these stories, we learn of just that many more precedents of people across time and space that have embedded messages into their textiles. I think using fiber optic be something that's a little bit newer because examples go way back in history of, of this phenomenon. Um, and part of why we wanted to use fiber optics is of is because of the way fiber optics are now used um, to communicate outside of textiles, but really ev everywhere. We're all probably relying on fiber optics to see each other right at this moment. Um, I'm also working on a cookbook and very excited to share, although I haven't, um, this might be my first time I'm sharing it even, because I haven't told all the participants yet, but um, I'll be publishing the, the cookbook in just a couple of weeks here in Switzerland. Um, it's a cookbook that asks artists and everyone is welcome, so if you didn't get your recipe in for the first issue, you're welcome to submit one for the next issue, but it's a, a collection of recipes that ask the author to take a um, a, a food recipe, a cooking recipe from their own cultural story or narrative, and either annotate it or rewrite it or update it to include some sort of social message, um, utilizing things like fermentation, boiling, chopping, roasting as metaphors for things like protesting, phone banking, um, picketing, all of these other sorts of social actions. And I started working on this project in the very early days of the pandemic. I guess it was a time where, you know, you both couldn't get yeast at the grocery store and George Floyd was murdered. And it was just this time of being stuck on the internet and stuck in the kitchen all, all at the same time. And really thinking about, again, the history of the different people that have used food, used the kitchen as a place um, to create social change. And you stir the pot um, is, it, it comes from this idiom to stir the pot, which I know I heard as a kid. I know my dad's on the call, so he could validate that. Um, you know, when I wanted to make things, when I wanted to, to change things, I was told don't stir the pot. Um, so actually this cookbook is asking people to go out there and stir the pot and make a recipe and make some social action. 
Um, the fermentation quilt, I guess this is the second of two projects that I'm talking about that share my interest in food. Um, and this project, also a collaboration, is using um, soft heaters and other e-textile techniques to create a tool with which you could make something like yogurt or um, sourdough or beer or any or kombucha or really anything else that is a fermentation. Um, again, something that started for me in the pandemic, being stuck at home and making, you know, wanting to experiment with the things that I had around me and also learning a, a way to learn some new techniques. Um, Mordent is an ongoing project as well that explores the relationship between food and textiles. Um, I've iterated this project a handful of times, and the basic premise is where I uh, cook a meal using food that is also traditionally used in the production of natural dye, serve that meal directly on the tablecloth, and invite people to enjoy the meal and sort of leave behind um, a trace. So natural dyers on the call um, might know that it's usually the part of the food that we don't eat that actually provides us with a more permanent color. So I think of this work as more of a performance, even though many of the cloths, which I still have in my storage unit, um, contain the the remnants of that meal. So afterwards, I um, treat the cloth and preserve the clean, clean out anything organic that's left over and preserve the marks that have been left. Um, so again, this project and, and the two before it are representing my experimentation, let's say, where food and textile are intersecting and, and really a deep thinking about where what can happen at the dinner table and the tools and materials that happen at the dinner table like the cloth, the, table, the dinner table cloth. Um, another project, um, also collaborative, is uh, Computer 1.0, and it's a collaboration with myself and Julian Goldman. Um, and we've uh, recently given our collaboration the name Soft Monitor because we're interested in the history of the computer and its connection to textiles and the weaving loom in particular, that jacquard loom. Um, so this piece is woven by hand. So far, I've woven it on a jack loom, but who knows what what the new iterations will be made with. Um, and through this very simple tabby or twill structure, I'm passing a hollow tubing. Um, the piece that hangs on the left contains, I believe, 900 feet of tubing, um, but we have made larger ones that um, pass more. And actually, the piece is currently on view at the Center for Craft in Asheville, North Carolina, if anyone's down there and wants to check it out. Um, and I have a video. Um, oops, that I'd like to play that describes this piece a little bit more clearly. I'm hoping the sound's gonna work for us. Most of human history, textile has been the one thing that has connected us all. Technology now has become something that shares that equalizing function. So Computer 1.0 is in part exploring this idea that both technology and textile have this overarching effect on people. The idea is to try to make a textile become a display, like a computer display. You know, from far away, we see these kind of waves of energy go through it and we can see these larger scale patterns. When people get closer, they interpret this information in a different way. The binary code was originally a weaving draft pattern. So our project is exploring the history of the computer, starting with the loom. We're born into a swaddle and we die with a burial shroud and no matter your gender or your race, you have an understanding of what cloth is. But we now live in a world where we also have a very intimate and uh, important connection to technology. I'd like to be able to upload images, upload different woven patterns, maybe text. With our patterns through the textile are readable by a cell phone, we can use the technology of augmented reality to share even more information about the story of the loom and its connection to the modern computer. The Luddite revolutions were because of an automated loom. Those kind of predictions of technology were very doomy, were very dystopian. It seems like over and over we end up sort of in the middle of this gradient between utopia and dystopia. One question I think we'd like to raise is, do our lives get better? Okay, go back to those slides. Uh, 
Um, yeah, so hopefully that video gives you uh, a better sense of the way the piece moves. And again, it's on view at the moment in at the Center for Craft in Asheville until the end of January. Um, okay, so transitioning a little bit and from a material point of view, um, I think maybe I've made it clear already that I'm a, a really hands-on maker. I'm really interested in materials, but I'm also really interested in storytelling. Um, and I've been over the last few years slowly but surely creating this film and I'm so um, pleased Laura when you introduced me as a filmmaker because sometimes I have a bit of imposter syndrome because I haven't made the film yet but I um, have I guess so also in addition to that um, just uh, what's the word like a founder uh, like I'm addicted to starting new projects and I just somehow um, I'm not going to let it stop me that I'm not a filmmaker or that I've never made a film before because I really believe in these stories and I really want the world to see them. Um, so I'll also show in a moment the trailer, uh, what we call the sizzle reel that I've made. Um, and I'm really hoping to get this project going. Um, it's been a passion project for sure and haven't been able or haven't been able to focus, let's say, on raising money for it quite yet. But I'm hoping to take that into a higher gear pretty soon. Um, made sure that text was real big so I couldn't miss it. When we think of textiles, we usually think of clothing or fabrics, but really it's so much more than that. I'd like to introduce our MIT bio suit. It literally is a second skin design. That circle will turn elliptical as she moves. We are currently developing uh, antibacterial medical implants with silk and textile techniques. Future Flora is a kit designed for women where the woman can make her own sanitary pad with bacteria and wear it in the underwear to treat and prevent candida infection. These are the materials that power, adorn, and signify our human life. Women's textile skills have been behind some of the world's biggest innovations, but we've mostly been left out of the stories that define those industries. We are missing half of the story. As many of us, I use textiles every day and I don't really realize it. I like to be inspired by ancient things to create new ones. These stories have really been undocumented until now. We'd never get to the moon if we always did it the same old way. Okay, so um, yeah, I, I hope that that trailer was clear in demonstrating that this documentary is meant to be um, a place where we're going to meet the women that are innovating with textiles and using them in places that we don't expect. And while um, male identifying people have been instrumental in a lot of the innovations around textiles, for sure, um, we don't often give credit to the women as frequently. Um, I think there's also this idea that um, you know, the entrepreneurial side of it has always been where the men have been introduced um, historically in almost every culture. It's been the women that have, had, have stewarded these traditions and it became men's work in the places where it is men's work when it became economic or when it became entrepreneurial. Um, so in a lot of ways, we've lost the uh, many of the authors of these technologies. Um, so my hope is that with this project, we can both give credit to those who've been left out of the story, but also help people who maybe work in another industry recognize how closely they are connected to textiles, that it really is everywhere, that you really find it in agriculture and sports and music and um, in aerospace design, and it's really everywhere, not just in fashion and art.
Um, so again, hopefully this comes to a streaming service near you soon. Um, and I'm really excited by what we've got planned um, ahead. Okay, so um, those are a bunch of projects that I'm working on, that I've been working on, that I'm going to continue working on. Um, and I'm, you know, I, I thought about what I wanted to say in terms of what makes weaving experimental, but I'm sort of pleased to notice that I maybe used that word experimentation already a, a bunch of times in talking about these things. And I think for me, um, experimentation has been primarily driven by my materials um, and experimenting with different materials, the things that you don't expect um, us to work with. I really love um, the fact that I can have a warp on my loom and just stick something in there. In fact, that was how the Computer One project came to be. Um, Julian, my collaborator, and I, we had been talking a lot about we want to make a textile that feels like a screen, but we don't necessarily want it to be made of LEDs. Um, so how can we make something that's changing and moving and responsive that doesn't use uh, a light? And um, we just had some like tubing from something else. And I was like, OK, let me weave it a few um, passes in the in the loom and we took a bottle of soda or something and just used our breath to pass it through and that was the beginning of the project so just this really um uninhibited approach to materials and um that story makes it sound like oh we just discover these ideas out of nowhere but i i think for every exciting idea i've had i've had about seventy-five thousand um unexciting ones and it's been for me the process of playing and experimenting truly um when i sometimes then eventually find something that's more interesting um and i've also talked about how much the stories behind these materials inspire me so really looking in and researching what something like wool or cotton or silk um, can tell us about the people that make it the people that um, work with it the people that profit from it um, where it goes when we're done with it there's so many possibilities for storytelling um, when you look more closely at our materials um, i've also been thinking about the possibilities of the textiles as, as objects. Um, so we looked at the Ancient Future Project, which I've got another photo of here with the fiber optics. Um, I've been experimenting with thermochromic pigments, um, and I don't yet know what that's going to be. So here's an experiment. Let's see, maybe next time I meet you all, um, it'll be integrated into one of my projects. Same with the image on the left, where I've been spinning um, seeds into my yarn and seeing what happens um, when I fertilize them. So again, I'm really not sure where these things are going. I've got a few experiments that I'd like to continue playing with, but let's find out. Um, and again, just, you know, playing with different materials like food or electronics uh, that you might not expect make sense in textile. Um, I have somehow discovered that they make so much sense just because of experimenting with them together. Um, so anyway, I hope I, I, my timing is right because I wanted to leave time for discussion and questions, but um, before I throw it back, uh, just another thank you to Stephen and Laura, and also thank you to everyone who came. Um, I would be thrilled to continue sharing my work with you all. Um, so there's a bunch of Instagram handles for all the different projects that you can follow along with. Thank you so much, Victoria. I have this image of like everywhere you walk, like a receipt tape of Instagram handles follows. <laughs> <laughs> it just gets longer and longer, um, which is a good thing because you're so energetic and involved in so many things. And that's really great. And thank you for, for bringing attention. Um, yeah, to a lot of the stories and histories that don't necessarily see the light of day, especially in the kind of innovation narratives. Um, now is the time where we go to questions. I think there have been some in the chat, but if anyone else has a question that's coming up, feel free to drop it in the chat and I'll turn it over to Stephen to moderate. Um, but usually I like to kick it off with the first question. And I think my experience um, in seeing your work, especially I think the soft monitor has been like, it has that perfect quality of like, it's so simple and so effective. Like, right, why didn't we ever think to do that before? And so I think there's this kind of interesting question in textiles and materials that the design space is so 
wide that there's still so many pockets to explore. And I guess I'm trying to think of what the question is around this. This might just be a thought, but like, how do you create a space where you can get there? Like, yes, you experiment, but what is, how do you create a space where experimentation is valuable? And how do you pick yourself up after the 75,000 things that don't work? <laughs> Thank you for that question. Um, and it makes me realize that I, I didn't mention really at all that I'm an educator. Um, and actually, one of the most essential parts of my practice as an artist is in being an educator. So I'm currently part time faculty at two universities in New York. Um, but then I also find myself teaching in a lot of community spaces. Um, and I find that the sort of the classroom or the, the shared space is is um, the location for all of that experimenting to happen in the most uh, fruitful way. So I'm really proud of all my work and I'm, I'm proud to say that even, but I think the work that I've made in collaboration is somehow the, the stuff I'm most proud of. I think that, like you said, this simple thing came um, through a lot of experimentation, but it also came to be because there were multiple brains working on it. Um, so we are working together and we're learning from each other, but we also are able to externalize that dialogue. So I hope that the classroom can be that for my students, um, or at least I try to facilitate that. And then when I'm not in the classroom, I try to facilitate it by myself, for myself by creating situations where I'm working um, together with other people. Um, and I think textile is just a great place for that to happen naturally historically it's been a thing that's made together in some cases you can't do it alone you need someone to help you warp your loom for example or um you know there there are also things that you might do at the same time like for me it's watching tv but historically it was maybe taking care of a kid or cooking a dinner while you then can take a break and spin your yarn so i feel like it's sort of baked into this material to collaborate um, from a kind of dna sort of level um, I don't know if I answered your question, but that's my ramble in response. To be fair, my question was rambling. And so <laughs> I think that's the perfect response. <laughs> um, so let's turn it to questions from the audience. Um, and then we'll take questions from the class at the end. Um, Stephen, can I turn it over to you to, to be our question shepherd? Oh, cool. Yes. Before? Thank you so much. Of course, I'd love to be the question shepherd. And I, and Victoria, thank you so much again for being here. Thanks for your work. I really enjoy your looking at your work. It's such a pleasure and so exciting to see new pieces that I haven't seen before. That's always uh, such a treat. So thank you so much for that. Um, and I also love the visual imagery you just evoked with your answer. It's that idea of like, uh, I always think of these people in, you know, uh, standing around for any instance and like spinning yarn in all their free time because they had to spin enough yarn to make the clothes for their entire family. I mean, that was just like, I guess you didn't look at your phone, right? So you just, <laughs> I mean, of course you didn't look at your phone. Um, <laughs> oh, we have a question to start us off from Jen this morning. Uh, Victoria, for the woven painting specifically, how much of the process is intuitive versus planned, which is always a great question for a uh, weaver. I love this Con this balance, right? Um, I.e. color palette, size of elements, which makes the whole piece. And at what point did these pieces get resolved? Uh, more at the beginning of the weaving process or in the final integration of the elements? And you have some amazing display elements. So this is a great question. I'd love to, I'd love to hear more about this. Yeah, thank you, Jen, for that question. I um love weaving and many of the, the techniques that are similar because it has this framework. I think for myself, and I, I know it's true in talking to other textile and weaving artists, um, that like a blank canvas, I don't have any interest in it, or, or it intimidates me, I guess. The freedom, um, the, the boundless freedom, it doesn't work for me. Instead, I think I'm actually more of a problem solver. So there's the, uh, the loom itself as a machine, or what draft am I going to pick, or what um, uh, weight yarn am I going to work with? Is it going to be this fiber or that fiber? So going through the, these frameworks, 
gives me, a, that, this is how I experience it, a freedom. Um, so the process is somehow like a, a planned intuition, <laughs> to use the words from the question. Um, and that, that works for me and I feel like I can make discoveries or create things that um, push boundaries because the boundaries are delineated. I hope that makes sense. Um, and then it's, it feels true as well for other choices like the size or the color. Um, but I don't necessarily begin unless I'm working on a commission. Um, it's happened a handful of times over the years where someone contacts me and they want an artwork for their space for whatever reason. And I know I'm working within certain more parameters, although I always make it clear that I can't just generate something identical um, because the process is also very unpredictable and from a color point of view because I'm working with the dyes. But anyway, I, I usually um, have an ex a material or a color that's exciting me. So I put that on the loom and then, um, okay, let's use this weft and this structure. And I, I really do follow my intuition, let the materials guide me, we could say. Um, and I also have boxes of unfinished pieces that I've woven a long time ago. And then, you know, eventually it just occurs to me, oh, now's the time for that thing. Or you know, I don't know, it's sometimes it's not the right moment. Um, and I, I think, again, another thing that many of us share is this tendency to hold on to stuff for a really long time. But it's just it happens just frequently enough that I use that thing that I've been carrying around for 15 years to justify continuing to carry the rest of it around forever. Um, and like uh, one example, I think uh, of this was I showed those pieces with the yellow frames, the textile that is inside them I wove five or six years before I made the frames. And I somehow I would take it out every once in a while and it just didn't feel right and then it did. Um, so that that's the process that that works for me and I'm always curious to talk to other artists about their relationship between intuition and planning. Um, I would love to have a glass, a cup of tea and talk to you more about that. That's like, yes, please. Um, also, thanks for encouraging my uh, hoarding tendencies in my studio. Uh, <laughs> I'm like, oh, justified. Um, I think all of us can agree with that. <laughs> that was a great answer. Um, and uh, the, anybody else who's here, just know that the chat is open. So if you want to just put your questions over in the chat, feel free. And of course, this is a different kind of forum than regular artist talks. Feel free to ask technical questions. Feel free to ask uh, any questions coming from different avenues. And uh, to start us off with a, um, a really great a question that I think many of us are asking is, um, what, and this question comes from uh, Becky, uh, what question, what is the flowing, what's flowing in those tubes? What's in those tubes? And how do you, how do you determining the information? Like how is the binary code being created by that liquid inside of the tubes? Sure, yeah, thank you, Becky, for that question. So the tubing itself, I think I mentioned it's hollow and it's like a polymer based tubing. And when we were um, making the initial prototypes and experiments for this project, we tried tons of tubing um, and we tried tons of liquids. And um, I would still really love to figure out a way to use multiple liquids, but for now it's a water-based liquid. Um, and I've used fiber reactive pigments to add the color to it. So in part, there's a conceptual um, inspiration for this because fiber active dyes are used to dye textiles and they also include mordants which are um, metals and we also use metal in our computers and so there's this sort of connection from the material standpoint um, to reassemble those materials that we might find in a computer or in a textile just into a different shape. Um, uh, we experimented with oil um, as a way to use two colors because, of course, water and oil are self-sorting, but we were never able, still haven't been able yet to find a pump that can accommodate the viscosity of both water or liquid. They're mostly designed for one or the other. Um, so for now, where it's not that water-based fiber reactive dye, it's air. Um, and so we're using... I guess I should have put a photo of the control, um, the operating system, but you can find it on my website or on my Instagram for sure. But anyway, we're using an air compressor, we're using a pressure vessel, we're using valves, and then there's an Arduino um, that controls it. And the Arduino code is rather simple, I guess, for me, it's not because I'm very new to programming and um, so, so much in awe of my programming friends that can just... Um, let it out of themselves like that but anyway it's it's simple i think relatively speaking in that it's um communicating with the 
pumps to say we take air for this much liquid for this much air for that you know 10 seconds here 10 seconds there and because it's one long path it's just a, a series of those results but um because things like water and air are subject to the elements of the space like gravity and compression the textures and the patterns are also going to shift um beyond our control so yeah so the dots the, the color that you see are water and where you don't see them it's air um thank you so much for that for that explanation i love that and it and um I always think of uh, with those pieces, I wonder if you thought about the tubing inside. I know you've been uh, interviewing um, astronauts. Did you think at all about the kind of tubing that goes into spacesuits? It, uh, for some reason, that's we work with people in aer astrophysics here and mm -hmm. it evoked that for me uh, for the cooling system inside of spacesuits. Am I just off, off, off kilter here? No, you're not. But I think it's instead that's more like a thing for my to do list than a thing I've already done. Um, because yeah, the, the people in and again, I sometimes feel like an imposter, but it is true that I've been talking to astronauts for the documentary, but um, I haven't yet investigated the way that they heat and cool the spacesuits through tubing. So it's definitely on the list now of things to look into. Um, I, I find that with every like new thing that I don't know how to do, or I should say that we don't know how to do because these are collaborative projects, you then have to go out and learn a new skill, right? right. Like learning how to cool a thing. And um, it becomes a dis distraction is the wrong word because it's fruitful, but it becomes a like a new path, a new um, branch on the tree of discovery. What a um, cheesy line there, but no, it's yeah. great. It's great. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, but I think that's um, what happens. And then oftentimes I learn a new thing and then it inspires the next project um, that you might not connect the dot back to. Um, that's Yeah, thank you so much for that, uh, for sharing that. I I, uh, I love hearing your internal process and, and that kind of thread of how you get to see, I'll use the cheesy, um, something cheesy today too. Um, a great question, another great question from Jen, uh, which I think is something probably a lot of people are asking. You do a lot of public projects. Um, you know, you're doing residencies, what are some of your strategies or what is your process uh, for funding these projects and installations? Um, write, write, write applications, I assume is part of it. Yeah, I write a ton of applications um, and I have been lucky to receive a lot of support. Um, I have learned in the process of being both accepted and rejected from the things that I've applied to that it's not always a reflection of my um, being deserving of it or of you know my being potentially someone who could contribute to that organization. There's so many factors that go in. Um, and like I mentioned, now being a co-organizer of a residency, I have even more insight into what that process process is like. Um, I think I, I'm tempted to give the advice of apply to everything and I'm a workaholic and I apply to everything, but I also know that's not very healthy. Um, I hope for residencies and grants um, in the future to find ways. Some of them are really great at it, others not so much, but to find ways to make it easier to apply because it can really be time consuming and um, what ends up happening is the people who have the time get to apply and then get the opportunity and then the people who might not have the time for whatever reason that is, they, they uh, don't have access. So um, um, let's see where the trends take us. But I love a, a short application. I also um, love it when there's a couple of rounds. So you can say like, hey, consider me. And, and if they say you're, you're just not the right fit, you don't waste your time writing a 15-page uh, application with budgets and project descriptions and that kind of thing. Um, when I'm looking for new things to apply for, I love to go to the websites of other artists, ones that I think are maybe similar to my own practice or um, who I aspire to be like, people who I see on a similar career path to mine, but perhaps a, a little bit farther down in their journey. Um, and then, you know, you go to the website and then you see who else did that residency and then it becomes, again, this tree of, of research. Um, um, but I, again, I'm really open to talking about this stuff, and I think it's a shame we don't talk more about it. So if anyone on the call is considering an application for a residency that I've done, I'm happy to give you my two cents. Um, a lot of these programs are really, really great, and I, I like the one I'm doing now. I noticed someone asked about, Jamie asked about the one I'm doing now in Switzerland. It's called um, TADA, and it's... Um, 
one of the most supportive residencies that I've done in, in a lot of ways, but in particular financially. So I'm being paid a salary and I'm given a place to live in a studio um, that I don't have to pay for. And I have a food budget and a material budget and a travel card and Switzerland is quite expensive. So I don't think most people could do this otherwise. Um, so I appreciate their sensitivity to what it means to be an artist um, and really treating it like a, a job that deserves to be paid. Um, their applications did close recently, I think, in, in mid-October, but you can keep your eye on it for next year. Um, it's been a really great residency. Thank you so much. Yeah, I, I appreciate your transparency. That is so helpful and so generous, and I hope we can all uh, bring that into our own practices as well um, to, to allow people to understand and, and to share that. I, it's so generous. Thank you. Um, and thanks for modeling that. I have one I have one last question that I'm going to combine from people here in the audience. Um, and then I think we'll hand it back over to Laura's class with their other questions. Um, there's a bunch of questions that you have, you know, very diverse uh, studio practice. Um, so combining two questions in this is one, how do you keep track of all these projects? Do you have a journaling, uh, a journaling process? And then two, um, and this is a great question as well coming from Stacy. It's like, how do you um, uh, how do you balance the idea of artists spreading themselves thin versus the deep dive? Because it seems like you have so much deep knowledge in specific sp places. But also, as you said, there's all these tree branches, right, that you're interested in. And so how do you keep track of things? And then how do you balance things? Or, or where do you think artists can balance things in your practice? Kind of two questions combined. Yeah, I really appreciate those questions because I and I try to bring this conversation into all of my classrooms as an educator because I found that this was somehow um, absent from my own education as an art student and there's like this myth that you're going to graduate and you're just like the compelled to make the thing and then some gallery discovers you and you're all set and I don't think this happens to anyone. Um, even the people it seems like it's happening to, I don't think it's really happening. And so um, I, I think it's important we talk about it. It's the reason I mentioned that. Um, so from a like technical point of view, I'm a big Google Doc, Discord, like I, I, I love to put things down um, in writing. Um, but I think with time, I've also given myself and received permission from um, people around me to try a new thing and to embrace not always being an expert. And I, I try to be clear about that, that I'm not an electrical engineer, even though I'm playing with electronics or that I'm not a filmmaker. Um, uh, even though I'm making a film, or maybe I should rephrase that instead, say like one can be a filmmaker even if they've not won a Grammy, let's say, um, and being a little bit more open and, and honest with where we're coming from as a way to like access new destinations. Um, I guess there's some like uh, some quote, I think it's an Ingmar Bergman quote that said once he became a filmmaker and was behind the camera, he sort of um, lost a little bit of the magic of the experience. And so maybe there's something about the lack of inhibition of a person who's never made a film that actually makes them the perfect person to make it, because I don't know exactly what the challenges are yet, so they're not intimidating me. Um, so I guess, you know, at my advice, again, I, I caution people to like, just go for it, because it's not healthy to be a workaholic. And that's a Work-life balance is something I struggle with, um, so I wouldn't want people to feel like that's the way because you you do need to take care of your mind and body and stuff like that. Um, but maybe the advice I would give is to try to just jump into something, um, find collaborators, and do it together. You don't have, we don't have to do this stuff alone. We shouldn't. Nothing is done alone. Another thing that I feel disappointed in a lot of our academic institutions that make it seem like people come up with an idea isolated and then they're the author. In fact, we're all influenced by everything around us. And um, I always try to say when I'm talking about someone who invented a thing, like, you know, we attribute this to them. But in fact, the, the idea comes from many minds in every situation. So really believing in that has given me permission to try new things because then I find new collaborators. Um, and yeah, I think that can be intimidating. Like if someone is saying, okay, I don't, but I don't know a collaborator. Um, I think it's great to just reach out to people. Worst case scenario, they don't write you back and you lost 10 minutes preparing an email. It's really not much lost actually. Best case scenario, they write back and they're like, yeah, I've been looking for someone like you too. And then something comes from it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, 
there are people asking if you're doing any workshops in New York. I'll let you answer that really quickly. And I'm sure everybody wants to have you as an instructor now um, <laughs> after all of this morning, including myself. I'll take one of your workshops. That sounds great. Yeah. Um, I'm just going to go to Switzerland right now. Um, bye, Laura. <laughs> have fun the rest of the semester. Uh, will you take over my class? Um, <laughs> Uh, Laura, I'm going to hand over, speaking of your class, I'm going to hand over the mic. Did we do that? Handing yeah. Him to you, Geraldo. Yeah. I love the Herald, the frequent Geraldo references. <laughs> um, well, I actually wanted to just take a moment to um, say thank you again to Victoria. Um, I have the mute off so if we do want to clap again um maybe it gives the feeling that there's people in the room um i also think there's sort of the zoom analog of clapping for all of you in the chat to maybe just jot a thank you or a few words or just hi from wherever because then seeing it all populate makes it just feel a little bit more like a community um one of the things i wanted to do before we go is we have one um talk left in the series uh, by our current artist in residence at Asandri. That talk will take place on November 30th. But I've been so heartened to see lots of familiar names in these chats, to hear more from this community, to hear about it being in different um, classrooms and things that I don't necessarily want it to end. So I maybe just wanted to take a quick poll from the audience of like, one quick idea of how we can keep the conversation going, um, or if it's worth having one final event where we do more of a community discussion and we get to know each other a little bit better. Um, because I have a feeling just anyone who's joining these calls, we, we would all be maybe fast friends. <laughs> and so also being able to, to share the work in some ways. So if you have any quick ideas that you would like to share in the chat, I would love to consider those. And um, yeah, I'm looking forward to more conversations. And most of all, just thank you so much to Victoria. Yeah, we'll do maybe one more clap. There's no shortage of clapping. <laughs> Thanks. Um, are there any questions for the class? 